In mathematics, graph theory is the study of graphs, which are mathematical structures used to model pairwise relations between objects. A graph in this context is made up of vertices, also called nodes or points, which are connected by edges, also called links or lines. A distinction is made between undirected graphs, where edges link two vertices symmetrically, and directed graphs, where edges link two vertices asymmetrically. So, what are some applications where graphs theory helps scientists and researchers do their work? Let's take a moment to list a few applications where graph theory every day impacts every person in the modern world. 1. Computer science. In computer science, graphs are used to represent networks of communication, data organization, computational devices, the flow of computation. Anyone who has ever used the internet benefits from graph theory. For instance, the link structure of a website is represented by a directed graph, in which the vertices represent web pages and directed edges represent links from one page to another. A similar approach using graph theory can be taken to problems in social media, travel, biology, computer chip design, mapping the progression of neurodegenerative diseases, and many other fields. The development of algorithms to handle graphs is therefore of major interest in computer science and the development of systems for artificial intelligence. 2. Linguistics. Graph theoretic methods, in various forms, have proven particularly useful in linguistics, since natural language often lends itself well to discrete structure. Traditionally, syntax and compositional semantics follow tree-based structures, whose expressive power lies in the principle of compositionality, modeled in a hierarchical graph. More contemporary approaches such as head-driven phrase structure grammar model the syntax of natural language using type feature structures, which are directed acyclic graphs. 3. Physics and Chemistry Graph theory is also used to study molecules in chemistry and physics. In condensed matter physics, the three-dimensional structure of complicated simulated atomic structures can be studied quantitatively by gathering statistics on graph-theoretic properties related to the topology of the atoms. Also, the Feynman graphs and rules of calculation summarize quantum field theory in a form in close contact with the experimental numbers one wants to understand. In chemistry a graph makes a natural model for a molecule, where vertices represent atoms and edges bonds. 4. Social Sciences Graph theory is also widely used in sociology as a way, for example, to measure to explore rumor spreading, notably through the use of social network analysis software. Under the umbrella of social networks are many different types of graphs. Acquaintanceship and friendship graphs describe whether people know each other. Influence graphs model whether certain people can influence the behavior of others. 5. Biology. Likewise, graph theory is useful in biology and conservation efforts where a vertex can represent regions where certain species exist, or inhabit, and the edges represent migration paths or movement between the regions. This information is important when looking at breeding patterns or tracking the spread of disease, parasites or how changes to the movement can affect other species. Graphs are also commonly used in molecular biology and genomics to model and analyze datasets with complex relationships. 6. Mathematics. In mathematics, graphs are useful in geometry and certain parts of topology such as knot theory. Algebraic graph theory has close links with group theory. Algebraic graph theory has been applied to many areas including dynamic systems and complexity. The seven bridges of Kernigsberg is a historically significant problem in mathematics. Its negative resolution by Leonhard Euler in 1736 laid the foundations of graph theory and prefigured the idea of topology. The city of Kernigsberg in Prussia, now Kaliningrad, Russia, located on both sides of the Pragel River. The city included two large islands, Nefof and Lomps, connected to the two mainland portions by seven bridges. The mathematical problem was for someone to walk in one day through the city and cross each of the seven bridges once and only once. By specifying the logical task unambiguously, solutions involving either reaching an island or mainland bank other than via one of the bridges or accessing any bridge without crossing to its other end are explicitly unacceptable. Leonhard Euler proved that the problem has no solution. Euler's difficulty was developing a suitable technique of analysis and subsequent tests that established this assertion with mathematical rigor. His negative solution for the seven bridges of Königsberg became legendary for developing a mathematical system for understanding many of the significant problems that scientists today examine. For example, computer networking and artificial intelligence extensively use the graph theory that came from Euler's paper that he presented in St. Petersburg, Russia, in 1736. First, Euler pointed out that the route inside each landmass of the city is irrelevant. The critical feature of a route is the sequence of bridges crossed. This approach allowed Euler to reformulate the problem in abstract terms, laying the foundations for graph theory, 
eliminating all features except the list of landmasses and the bridges connecting them. In modern times, one replaces each landmass with an abstract vertex or node, and each bridge with a conceptual connection, an edge, which only serves to record which that bridge connects pair of vertices landmasses. The resulting mathematical structure created the basis for graph theory. What does this have to do with the events in Chapter 2 of Alma and the Book of Mormon? It is possible to take all the details concerning the Battle of Zarahemla at harvest time in 87 BC and put the complete series of events from Alma's first-hand account within the framework of a grid of 25 square miles in 36 hours. We connect each of the events and lay them out on the grid of a map. Take another look at a video from last year and consider how the battle events confirm the physical location of Zarahemla. Just as the seven bridges of Königsberg were only in one city, so there is no other place in the world where the events of Alma Chapter 2 will fit except on, across, and near the Keokuk George of the Mississippi River at Montrose, Iowa. Every true story has details that are interrelated. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth require many parts that are joined together in time and place. Every good map has coordinates that are within a grid. This is a good way for dealing with space. Time moves forward. A straight line is a good way for ordering the sequence of events. The positions and movements of people within a grid of space and on a timeline are important for the discovery of the truth of any story. This then is the approach for understanding the geography that is the setting for the Battle of Zarahemla as described in Alma Chapter 2. There is no other event in the Book of Mormon that is so completely outlined in time and places Alma's first-hand account of the Battle of Zarahemla at the time of harvest in 87 BC. Using a text that is 2,107 years old, it is possible to create a space that has cells of one square mile, and a timeline of one day, one night, and another day. This approach is clear and subject to careful examination. The grid has 25 cells. The time is 36 hours. There is no confusion about how these events are laid out within a space of 25 square miles. There is no question of what the terrain is for each cell that is part of the story. There is a hill, a valley, a river, and a city. There are more than 100,000 people who are in four distinct groups who are moving within the grid of space and on the line of time. The requirements of the story are so clear. Once we discover the place and time, there is no other geography in the world that will satisfy the physical requirements for the Battle of Zarahemla. The grid for the story is determined by the ability of large groups of people to move in space along a timeline that is limited by one day, one night, and another day. The story is then set within the grid of 5 miles by 5 miles. The story starts at the time of harvest in the year of 87 BC. Within the story there are eight significant elements that involve place and movement. The river Sidon flows from north to south dividing the terrain into an east bank and a west bank. Cell A1, the city of Zarahemla on the west side of river Sidon. Cells A3 colon A4, the hill Amihu on the east side of river Sidon. Cells B5 colon C5, the valley of Gideon on the east side of river Sidon. Cell D5, Alma's army camping on the east side on the river Sidon. Cell D4, the walking of Alma's army across the river Sidon. Cell D3, the battle of three armies in the morning of the second day on the west bank and in the river Sidon. Outside grid, the retreat of the Amlicite and Lamanite armies towards the wilderness of her mounts that is off the grid and in a northwest direction from cell A1. The story has five large groups and movements of people, A. Alma's army of the Nephites. B. Amlicite's army of the Amlicites. C. The Lamanite army. D. Nephites who are within the protection of the city of Zarahemla, and E. Nephite refugees who are moving from the hinterlands towards Zarahemla seeking the protection of the city. Within the grid of 25 square miles, we have a city, a hill, a valley, and a large river that is at the center of the story. The east and west sides of the river are important for establishing the specific features that are found within the cells of the grid.